Seymour, it's good to have you here at Noise11.com uh, and good to see you back with a band and doing live shows again. Yeah, well, it'll, uh, it'll, be, it'll be strange just walking out. I'm actually quite nervous. Um, you know, we haven't performed for a long time. Um, we've got a couple of pretty solid days of rehearsal coming up. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll let the audience know that. They'll be aware of it as well. I, there'll be a general feeling in the room, I think, just the, the fact that it's new, it's fresh. and um, It'll be good, though. I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to it. Well, not only have you not been on stage for a while, the audience hasn't been <laughs> also in a, in a right. venue for a while as well, so it's even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Um, I'm always fascinated by what goes through my mind when I'm on stage. <laughs> People would, you know, some of the thoughts I have as I'm singing songs. I'll do a bit of talking now, I think. I like, to, I like the idea of telling stories as well now more than I used to, you know. Is that uh, something with age? I mean, because there's a bit of history there now. You've been doing this a very long time. Jeez, I was at uh, I was at Eon FM when those first Hutters and Collectors records came out. Oh God, Eon, that's right. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to try and make the show <clears throat> sort of a, a bit of a time capsule. I'm going to do two sets. And the second set will be the new album. I'll just do it from beginning to end. And, uh, and we'll bring Dorian Westing because he, he's the fifth guy on that record. Like he'd ne- we got him in specifically to record that album. And um, so he'll come out and we'll do that record as it is. Um, and which will be a new thing for me because, you know, song orders on records don't necessarily translate that well live, you know. Um, but... I'll let the audience know that that's what we're doing. So it'll, it'll, there'll be an element of novelty in it, that's for sure. And I think in the first set, I'm going to go right back. I'll, I'll try to make it, you know, I'll do some really old songs as well so that people get that sense of time passing, you know. With this new album, that's uh, 10 albums under your own name now. I haven't I haven't sort of gone and uh, balanced it up yet. Has, uh, has Mark Seymour solo recorded works taken over from Hutters and Collectors catalogue in terms of volume at this point yet? Uh, yeah, I've, I've surpassed the number. I've gone past that number. I've been told that. I actually don't know what the number is, but, um, yeah, I've been told that I've made more solo records than Hunters and Collectors records, yeah. Uh, it's a bit of a surprise, really. I mean, uh, I wasn't counting particularly, um, but uh, the time is part. I mean, look, I don't make records that often. But um, which gives you some idea of how long I've been doing it, you know. Um, yeah, uh, look, the time between albums varies quite dramatically too. I, know, I, de- I don't generally don't, I don't like to start a project until it's kind of the rule of thumb I've had for the last three albums. I just don't start a project until I've got the songs, you know, and however long that takes, you know, it's, uh, that's the songs rule everything. Yeah, when we take it uh, back to that first record contract, uh, you know, seeing you perform for uh, the Michael Gadinsky State Funeral last night reminded me of uh, White Records. And uh, were Hunters and Collectors the first act signed to White, the White Record label? Uh, yeah, well, the, the mythology is that, that he, he launched that label to get us. <laughs> and, you know, I... There's an element of marketing in all of that, you know. Really, I, I don't, I don't know whether it was absolutely necessary to do that. Um, you know, the band we had a particular, de- a certain kind of deal that sort of had written into it all this sort of these uh, artistic control clauses, you know, where um, there were certain things that they couldn't do unless they had our permission. I mean, it was just very tricky and strange. And then in the end, as time went by, we became the band just became more and more of a mainstream commercial act and the kind of deals we were signing just became more orthodox like everyone else's but it, when we first started it, there was all that whole idea that we were completely independent and we did everything ourselves and you know and so he came up with that label but you know i'm not sure it was absolutely necessary to, between you and me and a brick wall but anyway you know it must have felt unusual at the time because Mushroom Records, 
had already become the juggernaut at that point. We'd already had uh, the Skyhook Zero, we were well into the split ends, uh, True Colours had come out a couple of years earlier, and it yeah. was it was yeah. actually putting out volume pop records and rock records yeah. at that time. Uh, did you feel that you didn't fit with what Mushroom had become around 1981, 82? There was, there was definitely a, a sense that we were different, you know, and we had a different attitude. And to be honest, look, you know, I was just like a piggy in the middle. I'm the, I was the lead singer. I was head down, writing, singing. Um, I really didn't have a, a broad sense of what all of that meant, you know. And I never imagined the band would become like, you know, I remember, you know, watching that True Colours album and, and the Skyhooks record and going, oh, that's something we'll never do. Not because we actively wouldn't choose to do it, but it's I just never imagined that would happen to artists and collectors that we'd ever be that big, you know. And oddly enough, it sort of kind of worked out that way. I mean, we just didn't ever have any, we didn't have major commercial success until, you know, nine, ten years later. And, and we were just playing and playing and playing and, you know, moderate, having moderate increases in record sales over a long time. Um, and that's kind of what, how it worked out, you know. And so, you know, you lie in the bed you make, you know. Um, if, you know, the, the, the idea of actively choosing to try and write commercial songs, I mean, Split Ends did that. That's essentially, they, that True Colours album was a real turning point for them. You know, they hadn't had an album anywhere close to that big. And you could really hear it. I mean, I loved that record back in that, at that time. I thought that was one of my favourite records from that era, you know. Were you being considered for other record labels at that time or was, or was it just Mushroom, your only option? Uh, I think there was one other. I think there was one other label. Um, I can't remember who it was, but there was another offer on the table at one point. So, so what would have happened with the band? As you said, it took 10 years to achieve commercial success. These days, we, don't, we just don't see that at all. There's no artist development in the music industry at a commercial uh, record company level anymore. So, you know, had... Hunters and Collectors gone with say, a you know, different record other than Mushroom, would, would you have survived? Look, you know, I mean, I look at it in terms of just my own longevity as an artist. I often have the thought now that whatever had gone down, so if the band had stopped in 86, I think about all the different records the band made and, you know, what stage we were at at, at, at different points in time. I mean, Hunters and Collectors changed its spot so many times. It went from what one kind of band to being another kind and, you know, sound changed. And it was like, and I really don't, I, I actually don't, as a songwriter, I don't really relate to that particularly well. It was very much the decisions the band made, uh, you know, the professional decisions that the band made were really about its survival and, and for everybody's benefit. It wasn't really something that I thought about as a songwriter. And, you know, I always think, now, I often think now that, you know, if the band had if stopped in 87 or 89 or whatever, for whatever reason, I'd still be doing this. You know, I'd still be doing this interview. I'd still have a guitar there and I'd still be writing songs. I just know that's what I was put on the earth to do. You know, I'm totally, I'm totally immersed in it. And so one way or another, I may have more or less success, but I still would be doing it. So the idea that hunters and collectors depend needed that kind of a deal to survive you know i just it's such a hypothetical question really i mean and the band look you know the band as i said the band kept changing direction you know so many times every second or third album we just do this you know switch a rooney up you know stylistically and go off that and down that pathway and bring in a producer that put loops into the songs and you know i don't know and then the one, I mean, the difference between Cut and Demon Flower is just chalk and cheese. You, it's just a completely different production style. It's not like when you look at the pro progress of big rock bands throughout that era, you know, the ones that succeeded, it was a progressive, logical, you know, process of gradually changing their sound and becoming bigger and more commercial very slowly. Whereas Hunters and Collectors just sort of went, got to a certain point and then just 
threw the baby out with the bathwater and went in another direction, you know? And it would just be because the guys in the room just, okay, let's do this now. And it was comf- they were comfortable doing it. And that became, that would be the direction we choose, you know? I mean, I look back at it now and I go, why did we do that? You know? <laughs> but, you know, it's just, every band's got their story, you know? Um, you know? But in the, I just think in the end, you've got to, you just got to know what you want really, as an artist. And yeah. I've, I've got a much clearer idea now. I mean, it's taken me 40 whatever years to figure it out, but I, uh, I'm i definitely committed to what the, the the art and the craft of what I do, you know. And then 40 years down the track, along comes some scallywag, your friend and mine, Dwayne McDonald, and uh, gets the band back together and uh, takes you out on the road. It was a shame the whole thing came to a grinding halt because of uh, was it the bushfires then COVID uh, that uh, sort of got in the way of all of this I, I was at the first show I think uh, was at Bendigo and uh, we didn't know what was happening on on that, on that day because there, there, there was smoke around the area but it yeah, kind of right. didn't get to the show um, but you know by the time you got to the end of the tour COVID had hit in and uh, everything was off the road anyway. It actually ended with a with a wimp with a whimper, it was really strange. Like we had the gig, we'd done, we had two shows in Sydney that were meant to be on Cockatoo Island and this front came across the city and they had record rains. So it was like, it was insane. And the, the, the weather throughout that first couple of months was just abs- unprecedented. Like they had these incredibly intense bushfires and then there was this massive flood in New South Wales and... The, the, the whole site just got ruined, you know, and there were, he, we were in Sydney, like we were actually in Sydney and they called it off. And um, because, they, you know, you've got to, people have got to be ferried across the island. It was just too dangerous. And then, um, and then we were going to do Wollongong at the uh, Port Kembla footy oval. It's right. It's an incredible site. It's a beautiful location. Uh, and, like a, to the day, right up to the day before we, it was going to go ahead and the crew were all there and uh, everything was set up and uh, he pulled the pin on it because that's the thing about the whole COVID. When COVID started, it was no one really knew how to deal with it. Everyone was guessing and um, he just decided it was, he couldn't get, he couldn't do it. You know, there was too much anxiety. He had all this dialogue on Facebook, you know, some, his subscriber, whatever that base is, the Red Hot Summer crowd, whoever they are, um, a lot of people were really upset that the gig was actually going ahead. And so he just decided, oh, I can't do it. It's too, it's too dangerous, you know. So And oh, that yeah. ended there. I think that's when it stopped. Yeah, there were weird things, weren't there? Like uh, I recall the Bendigo show uh, with that threat of bushfire all around and the band performing everything's on fire and suddenly the the reality of the lyric with the reality of what was happening outside the venue really hit home. Yeah, I think I think we pulled that song at one stage. Oh, we, that's right. Um, we did uh, Bateman's Bay and we pulled that song. We couldn't do it. In fact, someone from the council asked us not to play it hmm. just because people might have, which is fair enough, you know. Um, I mean, it's not actually about bush. It's not about fire, <laughs> but the lot. I, I mean, the artwork had a lot of fire in it. There was a lot of animation, and we decided it was probably going to trigger people, so we didn't do it. So there, there are more shows, aren't they? That's at the end of the year for uh, some Red Hot Summer summer makeup shows. Well, that's the theory. Um, you know, we I, we we just can't make absolute. Guarantees. No, he can't even either, because he just doesn't know what the. Um, look, I would say it's probably going to happen. It's probably, but look, it's likely, but it might not, just because of the rules, you know, changing or. See, at the moment we're a bit. There's a general feeling that, that people aren't actually that keen to go out. You, you know, the, the ticket sale. People, all the promoters are watching each other, you know, so. Um, we just got to see how how much demand there is. Because I remember the last show or the second was going to be Ballarat and that was the big one. That was going to be really massive and that had sold out. Um, but 
he's just got to see whether or not he's going to be able to make it work. We'll get told at some point, you know. Well, in the meantime, you've got the undertow to go out and do, you know, whatever shows you can do between now and whenever, slow down a new album in there. So, you know, it must, it must sort of uh, regenerate the excitement to want to get back on stage when you've got new songs that have ne- never been performed. Well, it's just what I do, you know. I, I don't, I can't see the point in just going out and playing old songs. I mean, it's great. I don't have no problem with it. And people, it, it's a, it works. I mean, people really want to hear old songs, you know, but it just doesn't, it's not enough for me. You know, I would just die a very slow death. I think I'd just probably get old very quickly if I just did, you know, went out and just kept going around doing the same thing over and over again. It's just, it's just nothing. It's not interesting enough for me, really. Um, I just can't see the point. I mean, that's, the thing is, but it, that, that's the nature of rock and roll. I mean, it, you, you, if, you, if you're going to play new material, you've got to make the shows work to enable that to work, to, to like places like Mimo, you know, or, or, you know, these smaller clubs. They, and people, there is, a, there is a, an older audience that does actually want to hear new material. It's just not a very big audience. And you've just got to adapt to that, you know. Um, and that's more or less what we do, you know. I mean, those, that Red Hot Summer, that whole f- platform is all based on the idea of it's all nostalgia, you know, essentially, mm. which is all right. You know, it doesn't bother me too much. But the interesting thing that happened with Hunters was that um, uh, we actually had to, a lot of people didn't know our songs. You know, there was a very strong support base down the front and it kind of went back and there was a whole this dialogue at the front of house mixer because he could see people picking up their chairs and leaving, you know, at a certain point in the night. And apparently that's a, that is a problem that <clears throat> RHS has, with, even with Jimmy and <clears throat> John Farnham like that, they actually have to keep the set snappy and, you know, on, on, on point, you know, because <clears throat> people have been there for hours, you know, and they, they kind of start wandering off, you know. <clears throat> but we did actually have to, you know, adjust our set a few times which was interesting, interesting exercise for Hunters and Collectors to do because, you know, the, the band sort of lived in this bubble of being huge in pubs and people would just come along to hear it in that room, that space. Well, doing a big open air thing like that is really different for Hunters and Collectors, you know. Well, the, uh, the memo show is coming up in uh, April um, and I guess, you know, because that is the smaller show, that <coughs> is a very targeted fan base and they will be there to hear new music. Yeah, I think, that, you know, there, there, there are some rooms that, that you know, tip, there, there, there are a certain kind of club and it's, an, it's a very old school idea. People go along with an expectation that they're going to hear material they haven't heard before, you know. And, I mean, you don't want to, I'm not going to, there will be old songs in the set, you know, but they're receptive, you know, and it's, it's becoming more and more the case. I mean, it's, it's just the older audiences who know who I am, who've got, who will, who will, behaving like punters again, like they're, they're young, like they're in their 20s. You know, they're actually interested in... And not a lot of people at my age are doing that, are actually making, making the point of writing new material, you know, playing new songs. And we've sort of gone out in the limb in a way, I think. I mean, I, I just took it for granted that that's... I was always going to keep making new records. And then as it's gone further, further and further along, like you asked me before about how many records I went... I sort of realised actually, there's not a lot of people doing this, you know, and not it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but it, I've, I've sort of realised oh, people are getting used to the idea that Mark Zemel plays new songs, you know, and the more that's a, the expectations there now, you know, which is good, good for me. Well, I look forward to seeing uh, some uh, new Mark Seymour uh, performances in the not too distant future. Thank you for joining us here today, Mark. Thanks, Paul.